Hi, and welcome to Game Design, Things You Should Know at EGX Digital 2020. I'm Elizabeth Simones, also go by Ziz, and you can find me on Twitter at Games. and this is Rosa. Hi, I'm Rosa. Uh, my last name is incredibly difficult to pronounce, but I'll say it anyway, in case anyone wants to try. It's uh, Carbo Mascare. Uh, and I'm a game designer, that's why I'm here. <laughs> I can find me on Twitter at more Ellen and I'll pass it on to Mark. Thanks very much, Rosa. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Backler. I'm a, uh, a game designer by, uh, by trade. I now um, run a small game studio called Sketchbook Games. Uh, Jonathan? Uh, and I'm Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Wilson. I'm a level designer, which is why I, I'm here. And if you want to look me up, you can find me at Twitter on Omni slash 92. Cool. Uh, so this is going to be kind of a fireside chat between the four of us, um, talking about our experience with game design and then hopefully asking each other interesting questions and having a lovely discussion. So I guess just to kind of start us off, um, how did you get into games? And why don't we start with Jonathan? Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Um, so like my journey into games, uh, it's kind of a little bit like a typical one. So I just tried to go down the education route. Uh, or like you could do it like years ago, games courses started to become more popular in game traction. I wouldn't say they were particularly great, but it's a discussion for a completely another time. Uh, but they did, like, they did get better and they grow. But the one important thing I found for me, at least going down the education route, was it kept me focused on games. Like I knew that's where I wanted to end up being, but I didn't have a clue how to get there. Because in school and everything like that, you can't study games. You do maths, English, GCSE. There's not really any indication of that. And everything was about media. And I just stumbled across this one VTech course and found it was about game development. And then that kind of set me on my way. But it was just kind of like following it as far as I could go. But the ultimate passion of mine, especially within design, came around level design. And this is stuff that I was just became obsessed with throughout my education into the early stages of my career. And it's like, I even did a dissertation on it, uh, like basically how you can subtly guide players through spaces. So I just stripped the UI out of everything and started researching loads of different techniques you could do in like psychology and like how the player perceives the screen. I was just fascinated by all this stuff. And it was just going like down a really deep rabbit hole that I don't think I'm ever going to get to the bottom of which is quite exciting. So, uh, but yeah, that was, um, and then my first job was basically as a junior designer at a company called CodeSync. Uh, and then six years later, I, I'm currently working at Hangar 13 as a level designer. Uh, so I've had a quite varied path going down that route. Cool. cool. Uh, let's pass to, <laughs> to Rosa. Sure. Um, okay, so my path in games is actually quite weird. Um, so I actually started in architecture school. I did a BA in architecture and then halfway through architecture school, I realized I didn't want to be an architect. I really enjoyed university, but I, the actual practice of being an architect just seemed really dry. Um, so I got, that's when I got interested in games. I realized that the design process for designing games felt very similar to the design process that I was learning in architecture school. So I started pivoting everything towards games and some professors loved me for it. Some professors were like, you're never going to get hired as an architect with this sort of portfolio, but hey, <laughs> 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 I'm not an architect. Um, and yeah, and then um, I then went off and did a master's in game design um, to like fully pivot. Uh, and then after graduating, I was kind of in limbo for a little bit. Uh, I was trying out loads of different things. Um, I did digital content, did some programming, did some websites, did some writing, did, you know, did loads of little things. <laughs> and, so, and kept doing game jams and kept making games. Um, I then like started uh, pitching to bids to make my own games for educational games uh, and got some contracts that way. So I started designing some games uh, that way. <laughs> uh, and then I got contracted as a freelance game designer at various places. And that's how I then from there, this is where I am now freelancing as a game designer. Cool. Mark? 
Um, so I uh, studied games computing at Lincoln University, which um, was a handy course for me because I didn't really know which area of game development I wanted to go into. Like I knew from primary school I wanted to make games, but I didn't know loads about how that was actually done. And I, um, with a Commodore 64, tried to make games when I was a kid, failed spectacularly and didn't really get anywhere. And then, uh, you know, I was always knowing I wanted to do it, but it just seemed, um, yeah, very difficult to get into. And so I'd sort of picked A-levels that would help me do a, a uh, like a, a game development uh, degree course and then yeah that that particular course was useful because it had so many different modules and like maths 3d modeling and animation game design um, programming uh, yeah all, all sorts and um, then at the end of it I thought I wanted to be an artist because I'd found out that programming was still really uh, really hard and um, uh, so I was trying to build my art portfolio when I graduated, but then uh, a friend of mine had applied to electronic arts and got a job working on Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix as a uh, nice. integrator. And um, so he told me they were hiring. So I applied for, for that and, uh, and got the job there and then went to, to Lionhead Studios after that because that was a, like a six month contract, but it kept getting extended. Um, but then, yeah, after eight months, went over to, to Lionhead. And um, then actually, when working in the games industry, I found out a lot more about all the, the different roles and understood them a lot more and thought that design was something I would really like to, to work towards. And um, so, yeah, being a, a scripter on Fable 2, you sort of, um, you were implementing the, the missions in game and there was some room for design feedback on that and then I went to uh, Kuju Nicknack and worked as a, a designer there then back to Lionhead on um, uh, Milo and Kate and Fable the Journey and then to Marmalade Game Studios where I was a lead designer and then founded Sketchbook after that. Cool um, and I guess my story is kind of similar to Rosa's uh, where I was a dancer like for my entire like young life, I was either going to be a scientist or a dancer, but spent all of my time playing RuneScape or Neopets <laughs> or yep. Maple Story or all of those kinds of things. And it was like that kind of continued until at some point I was like, oh no, I'm definitely going to be a dancer. And then any time I had spare, which wasn't much, was played, was, I was playing games. And then finally got to my master's in choreography, which is, I guess, dance design. And it's like, nah, like what if like this interactive theater thing is, is really interested, interesting and this immersive theater thing is really interesting. And all of these indicative scoring stuff that they're doing for, that they've been doing for music for ages, that's all really interesting. And this is all just games. So I'm just gonna do games now. And that failed badly because mm -hmm. I was at a dance school and <laughs> that was a bad plan because they knew nothing about games. Um, but I learned a lot and I had to write 15,000 words about why my tutorialing system sucked. And that was, that was a really good, it was a really good experience, though it wasn't very much fun. Uh, since then I've kind of done a lot of unusual things, whether it's like making games for raves, uh, trying to figure out how, what kind of scaling you need for difficulty based on intoxication. Uh, making things for like End of All Shine and the Ink Factory where it's like large scale location based stuff based on film and TV to kind of your more standard PC games, console games. Um, and I've done lots of LARPs as well, I guess. So lots, lots of like many people in one space uh, doing very silly things. And how do you plan for that chaos or try to minimize it because maybe you're doing a climate change game in the University of Cambridge museums and they have very very small aisles and like things that have been around like literally okay this might be an incorrect fact but there's a rock that has oxygen in it from I think like billions of years ago so like you there's no running there but yeah that's <laughs> 
that's basically um my yeah my journey into the games industry was failing really hard and having to write about that failure but i th- i think that's a good thing though right it's like just pivoting yeah it's pivoting but it's also i guess like you know yeah, i think especially in games you have to fail right in order to learn uh and whether that's in iteration like if you build a level the first the first version of that level that's not the final version of it right or the first like pass of that mechanic is never the final one and i'm not saying like every iterate, every first iteration is like a failure you build upon what you learn you get something out of it but i think it's like you have to learn especially as like a designer that failure is not always a bad thing it's like you're going to learn from that and you're going to be able to build on it and without it you don't develop as like an individual so yeah. Yeah. I think writing that too like that sounds like an extreme essay, but it's like you forced you to analyze it, right? And I'm sure you learned a lot from it. <laughs> it was definitely intense. I guess like on that, like, because that's probably my favorite failure. Mm-hmm. Do you have do you all have a favorite failure? That's a really good question. Um... Yeah. <laughs> I guess if I was going to do other failures, what do you think? Because I've got lots of them that okay. are my fa- that I, I enjoy. Um, a lot of the rave games that I've made have completely failed because it was a really experimental space. It was a player base that I knew was completely up for weirdness and for going with it. And so I'd push things a lot further than I normally would feel comfortable with for a live event where players are right there and giving your feedback to your face. Um, <laughs> And so lots of those of just like the game completely falling flat where I learned so much from it um, were great. Okay, now someone else go. Uh, I was trying to make a game in Unity um, with rope physics and swinging because I really liked the Spider-Man game on the Mega Drive and in um, Worms Armageddon as well when you could swing with the grapple hooks and then like re- release your rope and then fire another one it feels really cool so i was trying to kind of capture that in a 2d platformer game and um uh yeah going back to my inability as a programmer i just couldn't get it working right so i i uh, ended up canning that and uh then in a in a game jam a while later i came up with the concept that turned into lost words and uh, which is our like studio's debut game and um so uh yeah i guess that was probably a favorite failure of that that game concept with the the swinging because i really yeah really wanted to to make it but the fact that i kind of put it to one side led to something else so uh, yeah i've got one um i don't know if any of you have ever tested with kids <laughs> they're Brutal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, if something doesn't work or they don't like something, they will just, they'll have no shame. They'll just say this mm-hmm. sucks and walk away. Yeah. Um, it's, so it's, I've had that happen a couple of times. <laughs> but you know, um, when they say they like it, that they're being honest as oh, well. Totally. Yes, saying, uh, the flat totally. Of you, just saying what they're doing. They're the best like litmus test for your game. <laughs> Hilariously, I am um, back in, like when I was really little, I had a friend that was like a child star and brought us in to Disney to test out the game for that franchise. Um, But I was one of the few like girls that came to test a video game. So instead they shuttled me off to the Kim Possible game where I just spent the entire day, like just, and I don't even remember any of this. I just remember like my mom tells me that this happened. Um, I remember little bits of it and playing it afterwards, but I, I assume I probably was also not very nice. <laughs> it's th- good though. Think, As a designer, uh, I feel like you need to be able to hear this and, and like yeah. learn from it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think um, like Rosa was saying, obviously kids or younger audiences are obviously the best form of feedback. But yeah, I guess like if I think about like small failures like that, it's like very early in my career, it's like making assumptions, just assuming gamers understand how to play stuff but as soon as you get the younger generation who haven't 
for instance, I'll use uh, so Shu, one of the first games I worked on was a platformer. And obviously in our minds, we've played games for generations. So you understand how platformers work, like instinctively you tap a button to jump and stuff like that. But as soon as you get into the younger generations and stuff, you need some kind of in-game explanation. So we try to tutorialize everything organically and you just assume it's going to work. No, it, it, it doesn't actually happen. And eventually you have to start thinking of, I'll do this X amount of times, give them the UI prompt at the right time and stuff like that. And that getting the kids feedback or younger generations feedback on it sure floor is not necessarily the best way to do it but when you're indie you can make that change overnight it's fine and then put a new build on the show for the next year um but it's just like getting that active feedback was so important but it did help me realize yeah just throw all assumptions out the window and just start believing that you're trying to cater for everyone and it just makes your game like overall so much better and it's helped me design tutorials and everything going forward so much easier i love it when you can do that and like make a change on the fly and then test yeah. it straight away that seems like the purest form of yeah. game design and development because yeah. you're right there on the cutting edge show floor and uh... but it's like when you when you first start out and you're doing your first game right and you show it at an expo or whatever usually you've got that build on a laptop running like somewhere locally right so if you want to make a quick change to the level or whatever you can probably just go to your hotel room overnight and you come back and you go and you build the next day um but for indies it, like i always found because um we, i did the red zone a couple of times with different people but just talking to different developers and we would do that stuff we'd make a quick fix and then we can assess that over in the next day of testing right because you've just got streams of people coming in to play your game and you just learn so much. Uh, like one of the things I used to do, I used to just kind of stand back and just observe different people, like different age groups and different like generations interacting just to see how they interpreted each level or each mechanic and stuff like that. You get some fascinating results. Yeah, I think what you said about not, uh, not making assumptions is really, really good. And it's like, I think a really good designer is good at telling when they're bringing in their own assumptions, yep. uh, particularly if they play a lot of games. So like we've built up that language. We know like, mm -hmm. you know, press a button to jump, uh, but so many players don't. Uh, and like, I've been working with a lot of audiences that aren't gamers. So I've made mm -hmm. games for, you know, you know, educational games, games for, you know, women who don't usually play the traditional games, so have a completely different language to the way they interact with digital things. Mm -hmm. um, to a traditional gamer. Yeah. Uh, so in that, in, in that, does that mean you have to kind of develop a different language with them, like through your game? Like you, you obviously have to establish some consistent rule that they can pick up and start to understand. And obviously you can't rely on the tropes of what a traditional gamer might understand, for instance. So I imagine that's a lot of thinking of how can I engage with this person and making it consistent because you've got to build up your own language. Yeah. I think what helps a lot is like looking outside of games for that language. Mm -hmm. So we look at like social media or like apps that we use, you know, in our day to day yeah. uh, and use language from there. Because they're very um, likely to have opened, I don't know, yeah, yeah. Instagram. Or, you know. It's actually what I was looking at before I went into games because I was at an art school and noticing like lots of non-traditional gallery formats and the confusion of the participant when they got into the space of going, okay, do I lick the art? Do I listen to the art? Do I touch the art? Uh, like, do I, do I ignore the art completely? Is the art like what, what's around the art? Um, cause that, cause I, that's what I was looking at because I was looking at like kind of cultural context of when you think of people who normally go to like, let's say a theater when the bell happens, you know it's time to go into the theater. When the lights start to dim, it's time to be quiet. And people who don't know that space feeling really uncomfortable in that space because they don't know the rules of engagement. And that's kind of how I ended up going into games because it was just like, oh, it's just all of those structured social rules, which is the same when you're in a game space of just like, okay, I assume I know X to jump, but like once you've seen people like walk into a room, an actual physical room and go, actually, I've, I know how to no move, but to I've no that. idea how I should move. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that like, that's, re that's really interesting because you're right, like now obviously games are, they're more believable than what they've kind of ever been. Like each generation brings with it 
its own new rules of expectations. But now it is a case of we have to look at the real world to see, almost simulate that in our games. Like, so when you see a character walking or you see you're talking to a character, it feels believable and we're not breaking, like kind of pulling the player out of the experience. And it's like, uh, it's kind of like, Rosa, you said you did architecture before this and you said you moved over because you found the design process very similar. Well, in level design now, like we spend 90% of our time looking at spaces from an architecture point of view. So the function of the space kind of comes a very important role. Then we argue with artists like because they just want it to look pretty, but we obviously argue about it, the functionality of it and it has to be believable. And then I, we have to work that into our game worlds. Uh, so I'm just wondering, have you brought any of that into like your gaming kind of experience? Because obviously you did architecture for a while beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like this is why I like talking to game designers. Actually, I'm gonna just turn off my background because okay. it's, my... <laughs> <laughs> it's making my, yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I did actually. Uh, so this is why I like talking to game designers about the process because mm -hmm. I feel like game design is one of those disciplines that has never built a process or like different people have built different processes. And like, yeah. I know like within academia, loads of people have been like, you know, mm -hmm. trying to consolidate it, but still kind of up in the air. You know, architecture is a, you know, architecture has been for, much, much longer than, um, yes. I mean, as a discipline, it's been much, much longer than video games, uh, game design. So they're much more entrenched in like a process. Mm -hmm. um, so what I kind of did is I just kind of grabbed the same process um, from architecture school and brought it into the games. Mm -hmm. In architecture school, the process was kind of like, so the first section would be research. So yeah. you'd just be looking at, you know, what's out there, what's the brief, pick up the design pillars um, and look at what other buildings there are out there and what they did. Um, then you get into uh, paper prototyping. Um, mm -hmm. So you take out really, you know, pick up tracing paper and start sketching uh, some ideas over you know, plans, sections, elevations, all of that. Uh, then in that week you take it to, well, we would take it to our tutor and uh, the tutor would kind of grab a red pen and like mark things that were wrong, things that, you know, should yeah. be different. Uh, and then we'd go back and, you know, do it all over again. So that was like kind of like the iteration mm -hmm. uh, part. And we'd have like different tools to do that with. So, you know, one would be like, yeah, sketching. And one would be like uh, mock mocking up. So like mm -hmm. uh, paper prototyping, which would be like grabbing like paper and uh, yeah. mocking up a model. Uh, 3D modeling as well. So we did lots of like you know, white boxing <laughs> from level design. Um, and yeah, and we just iterate on that until uh, we're happy with the design. Then we go into like, okay, let's do some proper cross sections, plans, relations, all of that, uh, and then present uh, the final design. Uh, so yeah, and I feel like games fits that really well. <laughs> I mean, what, what you just described there does sound like a very traditional level design process, like the research. So you get reference images of the space you're trying to create, then you'll do the block out. I, I guess the red pen part would be us playing through our block outs and iterating on them because they don't quite work right. So we'll identify problem areas, change them, test again, and do that over and over again. And the cross section stuff, I guess that's when you've locked down the blueprint. So like, I guess the layout of the building, uh, for example, that would be us sending it off to art. And that's when we can't touch it or our producers get very cross at us. So. <laughs> what about you, Mark? How is your, what's your process like? Um, well, I guess it depends on the exact um, bit that you're, you're working on really. But um, uh, yeah, so it can vary quite a lot. And like for, for Lost Words, we had the two very distinct sections of the game. So we had like the, the diary section and then the fantasy world. And we kind of designed both of those quite differently because the diary pages were all um, uh, it's sort of very, uh, they're very distinct and isolated from each other. So we just had like a um, slide deck and uh, we could kind of, yeah, throw in images from Google image search and, um, uh, and kind of just have reference stuff in there and, and kind of um, block out what they were going to be like. And then it was really easy to kind of move it around and then, um, for the fantasy world stuff, it was a bit trickier because the, the levels were kind of really long and uh, 
So we use a program called draw.io for blocking them out, but I was never all that happy with it really. It was like quite um, clunky and not very easy to iterate and kind of feedback on. And then, um, yeah, put everything into the game as a, a, a block out and then tested it out to see uh, see how it, how it played and move things around, uh, cut bits and um, uh, yeah, and then, do all the kind of polish pass on it from there. What about users? I mean, I guess it's, it, I guess it also depends because uh, often it kind of starts from, like I, I'm, I, I love a one page game design document. So that's, that will generally like underpin the entire process and it'll change quite drastically, but the main process I've kind of kept with me from the choreography is the really, so we had a few weeks of really fast iterativeness, of iter iterative design. Now, the piece I made there was ridiculous and involved me standing very still with lots of projectors and mirrors and lots of looped videos and stuff because it was still performance art instead of games but basically every single day everyone like made something in two hours and then you presented it and then had to listen in silence as everyone told you what they saw and what they thought your piece was about and what they thought it was and it was a group of like 40 people or something like that just telling you things that you didn't know existed in your piece or were just blatantly wrong because I've made a misstep of how I presented something. Um, and that kind of, I guess that kind of thinking, because even though I can't always do that anymore, the <laughs> having like people who have no idea what's going on, um, basically telling you what they thought it was about or what you're supposed to do um is really useful so my process is really as because i'm able to have real people in the space and see how that they do even, or even for the ones that i don't because it's just it's just play testing it's mm -hmm. iterative play testing constantly i have become very good at figuring out where i can get lots of play testers <laughs> often because uh, it was especially necessary um, but that kind of like listening and going okay this is this is completely not what I thought I was presenting that's really useful to know uh, is a huge part of my kind of like yeah a, a huge part of my process but I, th I think that's just a huge part of games in general right? yeah. and it's one thing I'll, I'll always kind of like champion and kind of put on it's like the earlier you can start getting something tested whether it be a mechanic it be a level or it be an actual mission depending on where you are in development as a designer like getting a designer to test it is great but they're usually on your team they usually know what you're doing you usually know the same process you're going through so the better form of testing you're going to get at least that at that early stage is if you can grab an artist or you can grab a programmer to come and test this and they'll give you feedback just by watching them and like uh, you said Liz it's like they just reveal so much stuff that you wouldn't see because you know the level like the back of your hand you built it you can't be objective anymore uh, you need some outside uh, inspiration from it and if you can get it in the hands of people outside the studio, then even better. Even better. Sometimes tricky to do that, especially at a bigger studio. But that, that was one thing I found quite um, freeing and uh, handy about it being our own thing of we could show whoever we wanted, whenever we wanted. And um, uh, so, yeah, it did make it nice and easy to get feedback. Although as we went on, it got harder and harder because to begin with, when we had the first like hour of, gameplay you could um you know take it to a show and get loads of feedback and but then as the game got longer it gets harder and harder and like now our playthrough is like five and a bit hours often and so it's a bit trickier to, especially um with the current pandemic situation to uh, to get people yeah. to sit down with you and um uh, and, and play it through and, and, and get all of that feedback but yeah it's definitely like so uh so vital and, and makes such a difference because there's always ways of like people interpret things differently or something that you thought was really clear absolutely isn't and um uh yeah it just makes 
such a, a, a massive difference, doesn't it? And, uh, and sometimes even you might learn stuff of like players all think one thing works a certain way. And rather than just trying to communicate the way that you've designed it, you can say, actually, we're going to kind of go with what everyone thinks. If they all think it should work this way, then let's do that. The path of least resistance. guess we should ask another question now. That seems like a, a thing that should happen. <laughs> um, Actually, I've got a question, maybe. Um, so, so what, I know some of us have gone to university to study game design. Uh, so how did you find, how did you find that helped you um, in your role, uh, did it? I guess I, we, we worked on a few projects, which was useful because you're getting hands-on experience. Um, in hindsight, we should have done even more, I think, and, and, um, and more of our own hobby projects outside of university. And I didn't know what a game jam was back then. I'm not sure if they'd even been invented. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, more, more of that would be good, but yeah, it's definitely handy to be actually starting to make games because I think that's the thing that makes the biggest difference, just getting that, that practice in and uh, making some bad games and failing, failing early and uh, learning from that. I think, yeah, similar, similar to Mark, it's like in uni, the course was quite structured to give you a very diverse range of skills. So you did a bit of modeling, uh, you did web development in first year, you did some graphics and stuff like that. And they overall, if we know in game development, you need UI, you need block out. So you need these like at least base level fundamental skills and you start to specialize towards the end. But yeah, just building more content. So I think the university course, at least it got me looking at editors, which I might not have heard of or used before. So it actually got me building stuff. Uh, I'll probably never use the creation kit again, but I, I did dabble in that a little bit. Uh, but once again, it's that isolated thing where it's not necessarily a lot of transferable skills in there. Like the process for building stuff is probably transferable, but when you build something, the logic you do and the way you build it, the level can only be used in one specific place. Uh, but yeah, one, one of the hardest things I think is figuring out how to build it because the one of the most daunting thing is, is opening Unity and not having anything. If you're not a programmer, you can't really code anything, right? Uh, so finding level editors. So as much as like the creation kit might be a bit weird, it's just like finding an editor that gives you all these assets to just go and build some gameplay and then iterate on that like afterwards. Like having more of that, I think is important for a lot of university courses to consider. It's just getting students to build more and participate more in like marks at like game jams and stuff. Just find them. You might not think you can do much, but with all the stuff in Unity and Unreal now, I'm sure you can put something together and just having loads of them, each one you do will get gradually better. Yeah, actually on the topic of like easy game making tools, like I f absolutely love things like Bitsy or Twine or uh, even like Game Maker, which make making games really easy. Like I know when I first started getting into game design, a lot of people say, oh, but you need to know how to program to do that. And like, actually, no, I no. don't need to know how to program. No. No. I remember spending so much time on uh, like computer science online courses, trying to learn how to program. And then like, I don't actually use programming in my job. <laughs> no. I don't the, need to know how to program to be a game designer. The tools um, are just getting better and better, aren't they? And there's, you know, um, sort of improved visual scripting and um, yeah, with the, the engines that you mentioned and there's always new ones coming out and, and they're, and they're being made more user friendly as well. So I think as it goes on, it's it, it's just going to get easier and easier to um, uh, like to to prototype and to to develop your own games um, with just a, a sense of logic rather than yeah uh, full full programming. Yeah, I, I think the especially the visual scripting side of it. I think everything is going the, down the visual right right now. We can do shaders visually with stuff like shader graph you can do vfx in unity now with their visual effects graph you're not having to code anywhere near as much as what you used to i do think it's important to understand the fundamentals so i don't mind going through and understanding how a program works because it does help especially with problem solving even making a visual flow graph for logic right like understanding those basics makes it much easier to throw all the nodes together you need to make something actually happen uh, and i do feel without that i would still struggle to do visual scripting for instance if i didn't actually understand how something should function 
Um, yeah, but yeah, absolutely. not a strong coder, not a strong coder Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, I think it is important to know, like, generally the logic of coding so mm -hmm. that you can have conversations with programmers and understand yeah. why the design does or doesn't work and how to tweak it so it does. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that, I think, you know, you don't need to sit down and uh, like the intricacies of C sharp. <laughs> well, it's like um, when I was ma mostly doing choreography, I thought I needed to know exactly how a light board worked and how lighting design worked. I needed to know how a sound, how the sound design worked. I, I learned how to be a stagehand and do rigging and build stuff. I didn't really need to know any of that. Like it was fun. I wouldn't do any, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like take that information away. Like I can run a QLab I, um, board. I can do all of that kind of stuff. It's less relevant now, but at the time, <laughs> um, but it was one of those things like I, well, the most useful thing I learned was how to be a designer that could talk to multiple disciplines and yeah. respect multiple disciplines. And when people come from, especially because I, I tend to work in these cross-disciplinary spaces of both theater, tech, games, all of these things at once, um, being able to know what the people are working with and their challenges and being able to communicate in a language that is shared or create it when necessary, which has been necessary. I've had to explain what games are in many pitches for people, for places that just do not work with games. Um, but it's, it's been interesting how much of what I thought I needed to know, I really didn't. I think I think that's like why at the when you first start being a designer, you're kind of a little bit of a jack of all trades because you've tried to learn all these additional skills thinking you need them. So you kind of be, almost become like a master of nothing at the very beginning, right? Because you don't quite know what you need to focus on to like kind of fit in. And then once you start building games with a team or anything like that, like that's when you start to realize, oh, I can actually just focus on the design aspect. I don't need to worry about, I need to learn how to script. I need to learn how to rig. I need to learn how to animate. It's like, no other people can do that and I, there's not obviously some people do everything and they go down the one-man band route and like that's fine but it's not essential you don't need to do that just to become a designer like overall it's too much work yeah. do you sometimes um worry about the number of game design courses and like how many people are uh, kind of going through it versus the number of jobs and like and how many companies yeah. actually employ a junior game designer because often you know, the, the role of designer means you're working with other people and you're having to kind of communicate yeah. things to them. And if you go in as a junior and you're having to tell people with a lot more experience, you know a lot more yeah. about what they're doing and, and what's going on than, than you do, then it, yeah, it can be, can be tricky. So the, yeah, there is a limited number of, uh, of experiences and especially the, if the courses are not, not so good and they're not teaching you some of that logic and, those great mm -hmm. tools and having you actually make stuff and it's all theory then um yeah it could be you know making it making it difficult going I feel, yeah i feel like there's a lot of students who go into game design without knowing that it's game whether it is exactly specifically game design that they want to do they yeah. think like oh i want to do something in games in general so they take a mm -hmm. game design course um, I've definitely seen, I mean, it might be different now, but I definitely saw that a lot when I was doing the master's and I talked to a lot of people in the master's and the undergrad that like not all of us wanted to be game designers, like someone wanted to be producers, some wanted to be artists, some wanted to work in VFX. Uh, it was very varied, but I think it's because like the title of the course is games. Yeah. <laughs> it just attracted people who were like generally interested in games. Yeah. I think like it's during that period of time as well. That's where you, I hopefully figure out what area of games you want to be in, right? And that's why I think courses have to be a little bit varied. So you dabble in a bit of 3D. Okay, this is where I want to specialize. I want to go be an environment artist. Or you do a bit of production, uh, which one thing I would say is like, if you're working as a designer in the industry, like I think there's a little bit of a producer in you all the time. Like it can't go away. It's like you own the content you build, right? If you whether you work on a game on a small team, like you've got to champion that content once it's out of your hands. Uh, cheers up the art, cheers up the animation. So there's a bit of a producer in all of us at the end of the day. 
Sometimes I feel like there's a bit of a conflict there though with uh, design and production because the designer in you is saying like more stuff and that's yep. like, really cool and what can we do and how can we make this as good as possible and the producer is saying yeah. how can we get this done on time and to budget and no yeah. you can't do that and this yeah. is all but that, that's where your actual producer comes in and stops you. The little producer inside you, you can stop and you can squash that like down but that's when your actual producer has to stop you. Uh-huh. <laughs> I guess, yeah, we have a little producer in our head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got great at game ideas. <laughs> so, so can, 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 I, can I do this? Yes. Do I have time to do this? We'll see. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was, I've, for a lot of the games, I had to be both like the lead game designer and the production director. And that that was always very <laughs> tricky of of that kind of balance of finding like, okay, I want the game to be as good as possible, but also we are, we are a hundred percent not crunching and Mm -hmm. the tickets are sold. The tickets are sold. The day is this day. You don't go back from that because they will show up at the venue and either the game will work on the phones or you'll be in a lot of trouble. (laughs) Yeah. So how did that work out then? That that uh, you you resolved that uh, design production conflict within yourself, all right, and uh, and it opened. Um, I changed our process a bit and made it so that we had a, a few weeks of previews before <laughs> so the first couple of weeks right, after a couple it. of uh, yeah. so you built like into your uh, into your process process where it wasn't yeah. there before. Yeah, I had the final play test in that like once we actually had like enough bodies in a room or in a park to stress test it because obviously that's the point everything goes wrong. It's like, yes, this works fine with two people. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess like um, obviously games, there is a process to follow when you're like developing a game or something, but have you found it? it's never the same? So it's like every project it's different. Yeah. yeah, I guess the only way it, it would be, or even if you're making a sequel, it's still your, you know, you you change things and it's different. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, if there ever was a time when you'd done exactly the same thing before, then you should worry because <laughs> like, no that, that, that. that's that's kind of my point. Is like, I think we learn from every project we do, but it's like the process is always going to change, right? Whether it be the technology, it be for update reasons, or like you said, you don't want to produce the same thing with a new coat of paint, right? Like that's not what you want to end up doing. Uh, but it's definitely one of the things I think it means you keep learning. And that's one of the exciting things, especially in the field of design, like you have to learn about the new tech. Uh, like for instance, ne- uh, next generation consoles, we have in the, at least the PS5, we have new controllers, right? So we can now use different sensors to interact with players that we could never use before, which might change how we think about designing a character controller or the warp system or anything like that. So I, I kind of like when we get to that point in the generation where we can go back to the drawing board because it's just a whole new rule set to learn how to leverage again. Yeah. I can't remember the title of it, but Jason Schreier's book is really good, looking at kind of, well, all different sizes of companies and all the different issues they went through with their games. And yeah. it, um, uh, it's got, um, yeah, in, indie titles in there, but also big AAA ones like uh, Diablo 3 and mm-hmm. Dragon Age, um, uh, like two or three, I think. And um, yeah, and the issue, and you think, yeah, with those, surely, you know, they know they're big companies. They're some of the most experienced people in the world. They've made one or two iterations of this game before. Like there can only be so many things that can uh, can go wrong. But actually, because every game is always different, there's always like an infinite amount of things that can go wrong. And while you've learned from the past one and you're like, okay, well, we're not going to make that mistake again. But then there's, you know, 10,000 other mistakes that you can and probably will make with something when it's just a bit different from what you've done before. Well, I think we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, yes, I'm pretty sure I can count. So <laughs> <laughs> good, good. <laughs> um, it's, just, it's one of those moments where you doubt yourself about this, like the smallest <laughs> thing. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> um, I guess does anyone have a question that we want to end on? Like, what's? I've got a question. Um... Book recommendations. 
Yeah. Well, so they have design. like a book. Yeah, a game design book. That. Well, why don't you start, Rosa? Because I have all of okay. these books are roses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gave them to you before uh, quarantine and they're still there. <laughs> they, they've moved house with me. I yeah. <laughs> Glad you're taking care of them. <laughs> um, I guess for me, the one I keep recommending is uh uh Making Deep Games by Dorothy Rush. Oh, which I'm this probably has there right now, so otherwise okay. I would have been like ta da so, <laughs> um, I think it's a thing. Yeah, it's yeah. I know it's it's not that well known, but I think it's probably like one of the best game design books I've ever read. Um, it's one of those books that made me feel very validated in the way I design because I had always kind of not always like I kind of designed in a very similar way to the way she does, and seeing it on paper, seeing it in a book, me going, yes, I am going in the right way. Um, uh, but yeah, she basically talks about designing games for meaning. Mm -hmm. um, so like, how do you design mechanics so that express things about life <laughs> or communicate an emotion or an idea? Um, yeah. How do you go about designing this sort of thing? Yeah. Um, okay. I, so I have, I have like a few, they're, they're like kind of broad design books, but like there's level up, which is kind of one I go back to quite often. And it is just a more generalized approach to looking at mechanics, like how you do that one page design document stuff that you used to talk about and talking to, about design in a broad way. Uh, I do, I always recommend a uh, level design concept theory and practice by uh, Rudolf Kramers. Uh, it's not, it's not a super new book. It's quite old, but it's one I picked up in uni and it's like the lessons it teaches you it's like, they're still practical and ethical to do. Uh, and then my, one of my favorite ones, especially for building levels is the like small like copy book table book is the 101 things I learned in architecture school because it's every page is like a new technique of how you can just build something into a level and it's just really easy to digest uh, but yeah they've helped me they've helped me a lot uh, uh, I really like um, Jesse Shell's um, book of lenses I think that's that's really good really good one really yeah. smart guy and Liz, uh, Liz is just like right here <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ray Costa's uh, Theory of Fun is, is great as well. I really That's enjoyed that. And I've uh, been meaning to pass it around to um, non-games industry people because uh, I think it's, it, yeah, it's a great kind of um, uh, window on uh, mm -hmm. what making games is all about. And mine's on my Kindle and I can't remember its name, so... <laughs> What's it about, like, specifically? It's, it's well, so it's, it's actually... It really it's a really simple book about like kind of like going through the process of being a game designer so but for me it's the vocabulary because I've come mm -hmm. from a different portion of like basically I went to school for design uh, like a master's in design and decided that games is what I wanted to design or like so I find what I'm most anxious about is that I don't know the words Right, okay. And so for me, this book, which I could probably just look it up on, <laughs> on my phone here, um, this, like, it really helped me, like, kind of like with what Rosa was saying, it's like, oh, yeah, I totally do that. Like, I've been doing that process. Like, actually, I've been doing that in my, like, choreography since I was 16, when I was, cho when I was choreographing those things. Um, it's, it's the same process that I did then. Um, mm -hmm. And I should probably know what the name is. I guess we're still kind of in the process of um, coining some of the terms because game design is still, uh, or, you know, especially digital, uh, uh, you know, still, I guess, kind of new in, in terms of compared to other mediums. And so yeah. it's still kind of finding its feet and, um, and we're still, yeah, still inventing that, that language for it. Definitely. But yeah, it was just like, it was really handy because it just had a glossary at the back of the book. Like, I mean, it's, it sounds so simple, but it's one of those like shared languages of like, mm -hmm. I've worked with a dramaturg for my games. That's not the term that you would use. And, that I'm, and she had a very specific role in the game. And it's like, okay, well, what is, and I know like some of the names are different. And everyone has a different word for everything, which isn't helping, by the way. I was like, <laughs> <No>. okay. <laughs> 
what is this role? Is this the role that I was expecting it to be? No, it's not the role I was expecting it to be. That is um, really tricky like, in the games industry. Well, uh, uh, at Marmalade, we were hiring a game designer and then we had like artists apply from different industries because designer to them means uh artist and so they yeah. were like yeah well, like graphic all, design well, i did all the images in this game and we were like but what game mechanics did you do and they were like well i drew this and and we were like no we seem to be on cross page and then we've had the same thing with um hiring producers at uh sketchbook and we kind of had people with um yeah different skill set and, and i guess it's one of those things of between different companies and different games the the roles can there's so many different responsibilities and, and aspects to the job that, um, yeah, it's very rare that something is exactly the same way it is at another studio. Yeah. 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 The most so confusing. I've, oh, I've got you the know book. the name now. I've got okay. the book. Oh, she found it. She found uh, it. Games, Design and Play, A Detailed Approach to Iterative Game Design by Colleen Macklin and John Sharp. Nice. Um, but I know, I'm sorry, we, I think we are coming very close to the end of our time. Uh, so Rose, if you want to say something quickly and then we should all wrap up, say our names again and wherever we want people to uh, find oh, us. So. Gosh, now it feels like this has to be like the concluding thing when it wasn't at all the concluding thing. Spotlight on you. Yeah, I was just going to say that it gets particularly confusing when you're working with people from outside of games. That design means something very different when you're working for someone from tech or like product design or UI, UX design. Like they have very different, you know, they talk about, for example, design systems. And for them, design systems means like typography, a color palette, uh, these sort of things, which is very yeah. different from like a game system. <laughs> so, That's for sure. yeah. yeah. Anyway, that, that was not at all the final <laughs> conclusion. <laughs> Well, do you want to do you want to finish off with who you are and your Twitter, and then I guess we'll just sign off for the night or day or whenever this is airing. It's a mystery. There mystery time, infinite time. So, uh, okay, I'm, sure. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go. So, <laughs> okay. this always happens. Um, so, I'm Rosa. Uh, freelance game designer, and you can find me at more Ellen on Twitter. So I'm uh, at Mark Backler on Twitter, and um, uh, our project uh, Lost Words is at Lost Words Game on Twitter. It's out on Stadia now, and it's out on uh, Steam, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch early next year. Uh, and we have a, a Steam page as well if anyone wants to check it out and, uh, and give us a wish list. Uh, and I'm Jonathan. Uh, you can find me at Omni slash 92 on Twitter. Uh, I'm a level designer, so just hit me up. I'm always game to talk design. So. Cool. And again, I'm Ziz. You can find me on Twitter at CSilk Games. And I'm a freelance game designer. And this has been Game Design, Things You Should Know. And I'm sure there'll be other things, but I haven't been told to say anything else. So I think we'll sign off there. Sound good? Yep. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.